Welcome to Hot Chips 33. Session 6 ML and Computation Platforms. Good afternoon, good evening, good night, and uh, for those who have wrapped around, good morning. Uh, my name is David Cantor. I'm the Executive Director of uh, ML Commons, where I had the privilege of leading the uh, ML Burp Inference Benchmarks, which you heard about a little earlier, as well as our uh, power measurement uh, uh, methodology. Um, and uh, perhaps for those reasons, I was uh, selected to chair the uh, ML and Computation Platform Session. You may have seen me earlier from the tutorial on Sunday. In that case, uh, welcome back. Uh, just like the tutorial, uh, each talk in this session will have a Slack channel, and I will be selecting questions from the channel for the Q&A Q sections of the talks. Uh, in addition, the speakers and or the uh, some of their team members may be joining us during the channel. Uh, I'm thrilled to have uh, four uh, uh, talks in my session. Uh, the first is from GraphCore, the second from Cerebris, the third from Samba Nova. These are, you know, three unicorn uh, ML startups. And to remind folks that ML is not the only game in town when it comes to specialized large-scale and high-performance computation. The uh, fourth talk will be from D.E. Shaw about Anton 3, uh, a protein folding supercomputer. So, uh, with that introduction out of the way, uh, I guess a, a couple of points. We have a bunch of fantastic opportunities to learn about software and hardware optimization. And uh, again, please be free with uh, your questions. Uh, also, I should mention that for the first talk, uh, uh, or sorry, for the third talk from the gentleman from Samba Nova, they will be in studio, so they may not be answering questions during the talk itself as they will be delivering it. Uh, the others are uh, pre-recorded. So, uh, without further ado, we're ready to go into our first talk, uh, which is from Simon Knowles, who is the co-founder, CTO, and executive vice president of engineering at GraphCore. He is going to be presenting the GraphCore Colossus MK2 IPU, GraphCore's uh, seven nanometer second generation ML accelerator. You may have noticed that there was a talk in the tutorial that discussed some of the optimizations uh, that uh, the GraphCore team did to run ML perp. So these two talks are somewhat duels. I would uh, absolutely encourage you to check one, that one out. Uh, now, without uh, and and now we can turn it over to uh, Simon for the video instantiation of Simon. Hello, and thank you to all the organizers of this year's Hot Chips. Colossus is a processor designed for AI computing. It's an implementation of some architectural ideas which amount to a new structural type of processor, like a GPU or a TPU. We call this an IPU, or intelligence processor. First of all, let me lay out the foundational beliefs which underpin the IPU idea. Firstly, AI is a nascent field of computing. We're discovering the algorithms of learning and inference and the characteristics of suitable hardware and software. It's important for AI processors to facilitate that exploration. Secondly, as far as we know, superhuman AI will require huge parametric state. Humans have about 200 trillion synaptic parameters, so that's a guide. If we scale the neural networks we use today to that size, the compute required for learning will be prohibitive. So sparse evaluation of large models will be essential, just like in the brain. Fourthly, we know there is much value in understanding sequence data like text and in images, but nature is full of more irregular data like molecules. So we need to embrace graph data too. And lastly, the golden age of silicon scaling is coming to an end. Power has been a primary design constraint for chips since Denard scaling ended 15 years ago, and now geometric scaling has slowed down too, 
So if we want ever more transistors, we must embrace spreading programs over many chips. The IPU idea is captured in its software and hardware abstractions. They're both pretty simple. The IPU software abstraction casts a program as a declared computational graph in which there are two types of vertex, one that computes and one that holds data as a tensor of any dimensions. The vertices are connected by directed stateless edges, which can form loops. The graph is bipartite, so the compute vertices operate on state held in the tensor vertices. The function of each compute vertex is defined by an associated atomic subprogram called a codelet. To execute a vertex is to run its codelet on its state. What causes that to happen is the control program. The control program captures the causality in the graph. Because the graph is loopy, the control program may reevaluate some vertices many times. For example, until a convergence criterion is met. Finally, there are pipes, which provide the graph with input and output. An IPU is an accelerator, like a GPU or a TPU, so it always, always has a host. And these I.O. pipes are terminated by a program running on that host. The IPU hardware abstraction is similarly straightforward. There are a large number of tiles, each containing a processor with some memory. The tiles communicate by sending data between their memories over a stateless all-to-all -all interconnect called the exchange. Each tile processor may run several concurrent threads, and each thread is capable of implementing a codelet. Tensor vertices may contain a lot of state, so they're often distributed over many tiles. They may also reside in off-chip memory. Finally, this hardware assembly remains coherent by operating in a bulk synchronous parallel manner. That is, all tiles execute independently until they need to communicate. Then they wait for all other tiles to reach that same condition and then they all communicate. The cycle repeats as many times as necessary for the program to complete. Colossus Mark II is, of course, GraphCore's second Colossus IPU. Like Colossus Mark I, it's as big as a fab reticle allows, and like Mark I, it sets a new record for the number of real transistors in a reticle-sized chip. The major difference between Mark I and Mark II is the move from 16 nanometers to 7 nanometers. Both chips are fabricated by TSMC. 7 nanometer allows much more processing logic and memory. Colossus Mark II has 1,472 independent processors and nearly 900 mibibytes of SRAM. This too is a record even for an SRAM chip. The peak compute rate of the Mark II chip is 250 teraflops per second, similar to its GPU contemporaries. The final thing to note is the huge on-chip bandwidths, which are the product of such extreme parallelism. 62 terabytes per second between tile processors and their memories, and nearly 8 terabytes per second of exchange bandwidth between the tile processors. So, what did we learn from Colossus Mark I? Here's a bit of a laundry list. First of all, Despite our determination to start with a minimum viable product and learn fast, we actually put more features into Mark I than we managed to light up during its lifetime. Sparse tensor arithmetic is an example. We rediscovered that extreme parallel processing is hard, even with simple abstractions. Mapping a large parallel program across chips efficiently requires deep knowledge of the hardware, which means most AI programmers need that to be automated which takes a lot of engineering. At the electrical level, we learned that bulk synchrony can really challenge power supplies, especially within the power constraints of PCI card. And at the customer level, we learned that everyone wants a different ratio of AI accelerators to server CPUs. So let's start with that last point. We deliver Colossus Mark II in a disaggregated chassis called M2000 a pizza box component from which one can build larger computers like the 512 IPU pod shown below right. Instead of trying to integrate a one-size-fits-all host server into the same chassis as the IPUs, M2000 
integrates a lightweight proxy host so that heavy host servers can be dynamically allocated alongside IPUs according to compute needs. M2000 contains four Colossus Mark II IPUs and the proxy host carries off-chip DRAM which those IPUs can use. The TDP of M2000 is 1.5 kilowatts. Typical applications use around one kilowatt. For example, ResNet 50 inference needs about 850 watts and BERT large training needs just over one kilowatt. I shan't talk much about our software stack today, but IPU machines are usually programmed like GPU machines in PyTorch or TensorFlow. We also have an Onyx interface and our own native graph framework called Poplar. Here are the headline structural parameters of contemporary IPUs, GPUs, and TPUs. I've shown two generations of each. IPU is distinctive in two primary ways. First of all, it's a more parallel machine, more fine-grained, if you like. It has more process cores. This really reflects our belief in the inevitability of sparsity and richer model structures. The contrast with TPU is especially striking. TPU assumes big, fat matrices are the way to go but it only takes something as simple as separable convolutions to spoil that assumption. IPU's second structural difference is its memory system. IPU uses its large on-chip SRAM to avoid the need for high bandwidth to off-die DRAM. IPU still uses DRAM, of course, for larger models, but that DRAM is much cheaper server class DDR attached to its host. I'll come back to demonstrate this later. You can get a good sense of Colossus Mark II's resources from this die shot. The pie chart shows the breakdown by silicon area. Processor tiles are arranged in columns above and below the communication spine of the exchange. The tiles occupy about three quarters of the die and the exchange is about 11%. About half of the die is memory, which confers a lower power density than GPUs and TPUs enabling us to deploy more IPUs within a system power budget. The chip clocks at 1.325 gigahertz, logically synchronous, but electrically mesochronous. In order to get good yield with such a huge die, it's highly repairable, of course. There is one spare tile for every 23 working and many other repairability aspects. So let's dig into the chip the tile processor is a dual path design with 32-bit instructions, which can be issued singly or in pairs. The main execution path handles control flow and addresses, anything integer. The second path, called AUX, does all the floating point heavy lifting. Both paths are barrel threaded, that is, they interleave threads per stage of their pipeline, so threads are executed round robin. There are six slots in the Colossus barrel. The AUX path has a second register file shared between all threads, which is used to hold common state for matrix operations, such as neural network weights. As well as the ubiquitous matrix algebra of AI, the tile processor has instructions for various transcendentals and a rich random number capability. The barrel threading of the tile processor is unusual in that there's one more thread context than there are slots in the barrel. The contexts represent a supervisor thread and up to six worker threads. Initially, all six execution slots belong to the supervisor. The supervisor's job is to do housekeeping and to launch worker threads to do the floating point heavy lifting. The supervisor dispatches a worker by executing a run instruction and in so doing relinquishes that execution slot to the worker. The worker thread runs one codelet that is, it updates the state of a vertex of the compute graph. Codelets run to completion, terminating with an exit instruction, which returns the slot to the supervisor. What's the point of all this? Well, the workers run at one-sixth of the chip clock and therefore can't see the pipeline. Memory accesses, branches, big floating point all appear to take one cycle per instruction. This makes codelet execution simple for the compiler to predict which makes it easier to load balance the whole graph program across this massively parallel machine. I mentioned at the start that sparsity is inevitable for potent AI at realistic training cost. 
What form it should take is the subject of vibrant research. But the availability of a large SRAM with nearly 50 terabytes per second of data side bandwidth provides unprecedented access to arbitrary data structures which fit within 900 mibibytes. So the Colossus ISA includes instructions for sparse gather in various forms in parallel with the arithmetic. These instructions use lists of compact pointers of two sizes, 16-bit absolute offsets from a base address and 4-bit delta offsets which accumulate from a base address. Like all AI accelerators, Colossus devotes significant transistor resources to linear algebra on tensors. Colossus supports IEEE float 16 and float 32 number formats, and tensor arithmetic can mix these in three combinations. There are two families of instructions. The AMP family performs one by one convolutions. With float 16 operands, this projects 16 input channels to 16 output channels. This is, of course, equivalent to a matrix matrix multiplication, but it makes sense to think of it as a convolution on Colossus because one operand dimension is not limited by register state, it is streamed from memory. In other words, the MAPMUL operation is 16 by 16 by n rather than an atomic 16 by 16 by 16. The n can be as large as tile memory allows. The second family of linear algebra instructions called SLIC performs convolutions with a 4x1 mask, sliding in the 4 dimension. With float 16 operands, this projects 4 input channels to 4 output channels. SLIC maintains high arithmetic fruit throughput for separated and grouped convolutions, operations which challenge especially a machine like TPU, which relies on large matrix dimensions for its parallelism. The final aspect of the tile instruction set I'll mention is random number generation. Each tile has a high quality PRNG with a separate context for each thread. Instructions provide vectors of uniform or Gaussian shaped noise can randomly puncture a vector with specified probability, for example, for dropout. And something unique to Colossus amongst AI accelerators, as far as I know, is that whenever a floating point result must be rounded down, this can be done stochastically. We have found that this is vital to achieving robust training using float 16 parameters across a wide range of models. Basically, if you have stochastic rounding and float 16, you almost never need float 32 state. If you don't have stochastic rounding, you often need to keep some tensors in float 32. We think stochastic rounding is essential to minimizing the required memory, bandwidth, and energy of AI. Let's look at how global program order is maintained across this assembly of many independent processor tiles. I referred earlier to BSP, Bulk Synchronous Parallel Execution, as part of the IPU hardware abstraction. The graphic here shows each of the 1,472 tiles on one chip moving between the three phases of BSP. The yellow indicates tiles waiting for global synchronization, the blue is the subsequent exchange of data between tiles, and the coral pink shows tiles starting to compute independently as soon as they have the data they need. When a tile runs out of work without more external data, it requests sync, and the BSP cycle repeats. This trace is from a fragment of BERT large, and you can see that we spend perhaps 60% of cycles in compute, 30% in exchange, and 10% waiting for sync. The ratios vary with application. Synchronization is a hardware mechanism, so it becomes vanishingly cheap if the compiler can do a good job of load balancing the processors. The final structural part of the Colossus Mark II we'll look at is the exchange, the eight terabyte per second fabric which carries data between tiles in the exchange phase of BSP. The hardware is super simple. Each tile has a 32-bit send port, a 32-bit receive port, and a control port which determines the source of received data. Sent data travels up or down a column to the central exchange spine, and thence east and west. The exchange spine has about 58,000 pipelined wires. Data to be received by a tile is picked off the exchange spine by a remote MUX located at the spine, 
which is controlled by the receiving tile. All communication is effected by executing tile instructions, which are scheduled by the compiler to occur at exact times after BSP sync. The compiler knows all point-to-point -point delays on the chip. This system can provide any mix of point-to-point -point and multicast communication changing at every clock cycle, but it does require communication patterns to be compiled. Advantages at the chip derive from only moving data. It minimizes transport energy. The physical reality is that truly synchronous global clocking at this scale is impossible. So the illusion of synchrony is achieved by mesochronous clocking. Real-time drift across the chip is about three clock cycles. So that brings us naturally to whole chip power. About two thirds of the total cost of ownership on AI computing system is capital equipment. The other one third is power proportional including essentially all operating costs. So power efficiency is an important cost factor for AI computing. The table shows total energy per flop at the die for virus data. Real application data burns somewhat less. The pie chart shows the breakdown of that energy. The distributed memory architecture limits the energy required for memory and transport so that the energy of arithmetic dominates, which is what we want. At the system, including host servers, the only easy way to compare the power efficiency of different architectures is to divide peak performance by TDP watts. We ultimately expect these systems to deliver a similar fraction of their peak performance and to use a similar fraction of their TDP, so the ratio should be faithful. On this metric, you can see that IPUs are more efficient than contemporary GPUs and TPUs. This should not be surprising for a distributed SRAM-centric architecture. The final aspect of IPU architecture I want to justify is our choice of memory system. IPUs are unusual in not using HBM, high bandwidth DRAM. Instead, IPUs use a combination of large on-die SRAM and low bandwidth remote DRAM. The foremost requirement of main memory in an AI computer is that it provides sufficient model capacity. Capacity determines what can be computed. Bandwidth just limits how fast. Superhuman AI will likely require models with very many terabytes of parameters. HBM has a serious cost problem at that scale, and the IPU architecture provides an alternative. The graphic on the left shows the underlying economics, comparing the latest HBM generation with contemporary server class DDR4, both using 8 gigabit die. The HBM die is more than twice the area of the DDR4 die for the same capacity. So costs are about twice as much to manufacture. HBM dice are then TSV etched and stacked with a base die to form a known good die component. The DDR dice are assembled onto a DIM with additional ECC components. At the factory gates of the memory manufacturer, the HBM stack is more than twice the cost of the DDR DIM per gigabyte. COWAS assembly of the HBM stacks with a processor doubles the cost again. And finally, the processor vendor must add its 60% margin to the assembled module. This margin stacking does not occur for the DDR DIM because the user can source that directly from the ma memory manufacturer. In fact, a primary reason for the emergence of a pluggable ecosystem of computer components is to avoid margin stacking. No data center owner ever unplugs a server CPU. So the net cost of HBM integrated with an AI processor is greater than 10 times the cost of server class DDR per byte. Even at modest capacity, HBM dominates the processor module cost. If an AI computer can use DDR instead, it can deploy more AI processors for the same total cost of ownership. So can AI processors operate well without HBM? In an IPU system, model state is placed in SRAM or DDR according to the size of model. Small models can live entirely on die and enjoy almost unlimited bandwidth. Mid-sized models can be spread over the SRAM of a cluster of chips, which would anyway be required for sufficient training compute. And only large models need keep their model state off chip. 
and large models have high computational intensity, flops per byte. At all scales, it usually makes sense to keep the training optimizer state off-chip and to distribute it over all the chips. Optimizer state is accessed only once per model update and does not require high local bandwidth if distributed. So can the large model off-chip case on the right perform well without high bandwidth memory? Here's a crude inference example which shows that high bandwidth off-chip memory and large on-die memory are alternatives which can both deliver similar performance. The scenario assumes a chip streams weights from off-chip DRAM in small chunks and applies them to a data tensor to compute a similarly sized result. The data tensor is n samples by Q quanta by F features. Each streamed weight is reused n Q times, leading to the relation at the bottom left. This says that the more SRAM you have on chip, the less you need bandwidth to DRAM off chip. The graph on the right shows this for a chip executing at 100 teraflops per second with feature dimensions of 1000 or 4000. The GPU succeeds with small on-chip state and large off-chip bandwidth, and the IPU equally succeeds with its large on-die SRAM, which collapses the required off-chip bandwidth to a few gigabytes per second. The IPU memory system has the net advantage, because that large DRAM needed for potent AI models will be 10 times cheaper. Let me finish with an observation that although it takes a long time to get new machines like IPU to work at all, there comes an inflection point at which progress is very rapid. I believe our Colossus IPU is at that point now, after more than five years hard work. Here I list the various IPU's hardware features, which are intended to make it easier to develop software, and which are now delivering on that promise. The evidence is on the right, showing significant strides in application performance over just the last few months. There's more to come, for sure. So this has been a brief but furious introduction to Colossus Mark II and the IPU architecture. What and why? If you take away one message, it should be this. IPU is a new and potent tool for the discovery of artificial intelligence, with a very keen emphasis on total cost of ownership. Thank you for listening. We now have Simon uh, uh, Transatlantically here to, to answer uh, Q&A, uh, and probably at 8 o'clock at night. Is that right, Simon? Uh, that's right, roughly. All right. So uh, thank you very much again for the presentation. Uh, I've got, I'm going to pick out, I'm going to actually start with one of my own questions and then pick out some of the better ones from the channel. Um, so you mentioned that the clocking is misochronous, um, mm. but uh, the fabric is controlled uh, statically at uh, compile time. So how do you handle uh, that? Do you just sort of assume uh, worst case clocking delays, uh, or, or is there something else going on there? Well, because the clocking is mesochronous rather than asynchronous, uh, behaviorally, it acts as if it were completely synchronous. So to the compiler, which is scheduling the exchange instructions, it, it behaves as if it's synchronous. In practice, uh, it's not synchronous. Um, clocks and data chase each other uh, across the surface of the die. And in fact, that one of the main reasons for the fishbone layout of the exchange with columns of uh, tiles is to try and make that mesochronous clocking fairly straightforward. <clears throat> So it's not like a big synchronous grid, grid where everything happens at once. There is a gradual drift uh, of a particular time of day across the surface of the tile. Got it. No, that's great. Um, and then we have uh, a question from uh, Sean Jensen Gray of, of Google about the stochastic rounding. So uh, are, are results deterministic? Uh, is the PR and G state uh, coordinated? Uh, yes, they're completely deterministic because each thread of each tile processor has its own seed. Um, and so from the point at which you set the seeds, which can, of course, be synchronous under BSP, um, everything after that is completely deterministic. So if you start with the same seeds, you'll get the same result. All right. 
And then, now, you had mentioned that there are uh, dedicated instructions, loads and source codes, uh, for uh, uh, sparse memory access. Now, hmm. are those intended for sparse weights or sparse activations or both? Uh, the place where we thought uh, initially, bear in mind that these were architected uh, some years ago now, um, the place where we thought they would be useful uh, is in blocks of weights uh, which have been punctured. Um, and, and specifically, therefore, we were focused on, on weights. But I, I think the same thing would apply to, uh, to blocks of activations that had been uh, punctured and, and gradients accordingly. Um, what we've actually found is that sparsity uh, at a very, very fine grain level uh, is quite difficult. Um, and, and what's much more attractive, actually, is sparsity at the level of blocks. Um, so, in fact, the sparse load store instructions are probably the most useful for picking up uh, sparse vectors, which are columns or rows of a matrix, rather than scalar elements from a matrix. Great. All right. So we have a question from Ratika Borkar of uh, NVIDIA, and she asks, um, in, in this case, uh, you indicated that in Mark 1, there was a lot of time spent tuning code to fit in the tile memory. Was this a partial motivator for the separate instruction uh, memory in Mark 2? And, and if not, then what was sort of the thinking there? Neither Mark 1 nor Mark 2 have a separate instruction memory. The instructions live in exactly the same memory as the data. Um, and there's also no uh, meaningful instruction cache, uh, largely because the, the bulk of the computing is done by the worker threads, uh, and they're very deterministic. And, and as I explained in the presentation, they don't see the pipeline. Um, so there's really not much use for caches. Um, and, and instead, what you've got is a... Uh, a machine with six times 1,472 virtual processors, uh, each of which is not pipelined and therefore is, is highly predictable um, to the compiler. So there is no separate instruction cache on either versions of Colossus. Right, okay. So it's a uh, unified uh, uh, instruction, mem uh, instruction Correct. and data memory in uh, each... Uh, I'm going to call them a core, but maybe... <laughs> yes, I like mean... By all means, do. I think I did in my list of cores at the beginning of the presentation, indeed, the first one is cores. It has a full instantiation of the classic, you know, fetch through execute and write back pipeline is a core. Um, I agree okay. with you. <laughs> all right. So we had two questions about DSP. Uh, and I think one is uh, uh, from Ralph Wittig asking if you had thought about pipelining the exchange and compute phases. Uh, Ralph Wittig is, of course, from Xilinx. And then a sort of mm. second one uh, about uh, if there's an advantage for BSP in the context of graph neural network implementation. And so maybe uh, take one of those, and then we'll probably have to wrap. Yeah, so, so let me ask Ralph, answer Ralph's question quickly. Uh, what we decided early on was that future compute engines would be very much power limited. In other words, we could easily put down as many floating point units as we liked and hit a power, practical power limit. Um, and, and also, we could put down any huge amount of communication and hit a practical power limit. Uh, and what BSP does is, is separates those two tasks in time. Um, so you don't have to, if you separate them in time, uh, what, what it saves you is that you don't have to decide how much of your power budget to spend on compute and how much to spend on, um, on communication uh, by overlapping them. Uh, instead, you have a system which basically spends all the power it's got doing compute until the compute's done. And then it spends all the power it's got doing the communication until the communication's done. And in a power-limited environment, that's, that's a more efficient thing to do because your program executes as quickly as it can, given the power budget. Right. More efficient than overlapping, surprisingly. Okay. Uh, I think on that note, uh, maybe you can take the rest of the questions in the Slack channel. I see some I can. good ones from uh, Natalia, from Cerebris, from Cliff at Google, etc. But we are going to have to switch into our next talk, uh, which is uh, from uh, Sean Lee, uh, who is a computer architect and has worked on a variety of technologies, including uh, transactional memory, one of my favorites. Uh, high-performance CPUs, networking, storage, and large-scale distributed clusters. He's currently the co-founder and chief hardware architect at Cerebrus, 
where he is building the hardware and software for their deep learning system. So, uh, this talk will sort of focus on uh, uh, using CS2 in a uh, sort of new uh, method and uh, new system configuration. So, uh, let's uh, roll the video. Hi everyone, I'm Sean, co-founder and chief hardware architect at Cerebrus Systems. We started Cerebrus with a vision to drastically change the landscape of compute for AI. And today, I'll share with you our next big step in realizing that vision. For those of you who don't know us, Cerebrus began in 2016 to solve the problem of AI compute. In 2019, we introduced the Wafer Scale Engine, the biggest chip in the world by 56 times to deliver cluster scale performance in a single chip. A short year and a half later, we announced our second generation wafer scale engine called the WSC2. With 2.6 trillion transistors on a single chip and 850,000 AI optimized cores. And we're now shipping the Cerebrus CS2 system built around the WSC2 with exactly the same data center footprint as our first generation CS1, but with more than double the cores, more than double the memory and fabric bandwidth. All of this purpose built to solve the problems of running neural networks. But I'm here today because the industry is demanding more. Because we're just at the beginning of what neural networks can do and we're already reaching a pace where traditional approaches can't keep up. In 2018, state-of-the-art neural networks had a few hundred million parameters. That's a lot. But in 2019, models like GPT-2 and Megatron, they were 10 times larger. And just last year, we've seen models like GPT-3 with 175 billion parameters. And companies like Google and Microsoft are planning models with trillions of parameters. That's 1,000 times larger models and 1,000 times more compute in just two years. For people trying to train models like GPT-3 today, they're using over 1,000 GPUs for several months. And that's just 175 billion parameters. Tomorrow, we'll want to train multi-trillion parameter models, and we need to do it fast enough to experiment, to iterate, and to perfect. Something just has to change. We need a better approach. But why don't we have that already? What makes supporting large models so hard? Well, fundamentally giant models need massive memory, compute, and massive communication to tie it all together. Trying to provide this with thousands of small devices turns the scaling of all three of these into distributed problems that are interdependent. As the model size grow, we need to do more partitioning of the model onto more chips, and we need to do more fine-grained coordination and more synchronization. It becomes an explosion of distribution complexity to get all of this to work together to solve a single neural network problem. And this complexity grows dramatically with the cluster size and becomes overwhelming at extreme scale. So at Cerebrus, we spent the last year figuring out how to solve this problem. Building on the architectural foundations of the WSC2 and the CS2, today I'm presenting to you the Cerebrus architecture for extreme scale. A new style of execution that will enable models up to 120 trillion parameters on a single CS2 system. That's around the number of synapses in the human brain. Whoa. But as you all know, it's not just about scaling it. We also need to run it fast. And for that, we've developed technologies that allow this architecture to scale. Up to a cluster size of 192 CS2 systems with near linear performance scaling with the ability to accelerate up to 10 times unstructured weight sparsity. And all of this packaged in a hardware software co-design solution that makes programming any size cluster as easy as a single system. Let me show you how we'll be able to do this. 
To address the traditional challenges of scaling, we've created a new execution model we call weight streaming. We take what's traditionally been this complex intertwined problem of distributed memory, compute, and communication, and all the synchronization between them, and we've separated them all. We separated the memory from the compute, fundamentally disaggregating them. And by doing so, making the communication elegant and straightforward. The reason we can do this is because neural networks use memory differently for different co components of the model. So we can design a purpose-built solution for each type of memory and for each type of compute. And as a result, untangle them and completely simplify the scaling problem. And by disaggregation, the weight streaming execution model also provides unique flexibility because we can scale independently the model size and the training speed. So the user can right size the solution to their problem. Let's see what this looks like. The primary compute unit is a Cerebrus CS2 system. With 850,000 cores in a single chip, it is the large foundational building block on which all large model layers can run without being partitioned. Next, to handle these models of extreme size, we add an external store to hold all the model parameters or weights. We call this technology Memory X, and it's designed specifically to scale to extreme model sizes capable of supporting up to 120 trillion neural network weights, and it's optimized to intelligently stream these to the CS2 in a way that eliminates the impact of communication latency. Next, completely independent of that memory, we introduce an interconnect to scale up the number of CS2 systems to deliver massive compute performance. We call this interconnect technology SWARMX. It's also specially designed to scale neural network training to cluster up to 192 CS2 systems with near linear performance scaling. And lastly, weight streaming ties us all together with the Cerebra software stack in a simple execution flow that avoids the traditional complexity of, of, dis, of distributed ML. This architecture enables a user to program the entire cluster in the same way they would a single system. And since it's hard to visualize easy to use software, let's just say it's as easy as Pi. Now, let's dive a bit deeper to see how this is all done. First, I want to describe the new weight streaming execution model, the underpinnings of this new architecture. In this execution mode, all model weights are stored externally in the memory X unit, and they're streamed onto the CS2 system as they're needed to compute each layer of the network one layer at a time. The weights are not stored on the CS2, not even temporarily, but as they stream through, the CS2 performs the computation and the resulting activations stay resident on the CS2 ready for the next layer. On the backward pass, the gradients are streamed in the reverse direction back to the memory X unit. There, the weight update is performed in time to be used for the next iteration of training. It's easiest to see how this works through an example. Here's a simple four layer neural network. We start by bringing in the samples from a training data set and we store them on the wafer. Then we execute layer one by streaming in the weights. As those weights hit the wafer, activations are being computed and they're being kept on the wafer ready to be used by the next layer. To execute layer two, we do the same and this proceeds until the end of the network through layer three and layer four. And finally, at the end of the forward pass, we bring in the labels from the training data set and we compute the loss. And that starts the backward pass, which runs in very much the same way as the forward pass. First, by streaming in layer four weights to compute the deltas. And then we compute the gradients and we stream them back to the memory X unit where the weight update happens. Then we repeat this for the remainder of the layers. Layer three, layer two, 
until finally the layer one gradients are computed and the final set of weights are updated. And that's the full mini batch. Then we process this entire thing again for the next iteration. So as you can see, the weight streaming execution model is quite simple. But you're probably wondering, doesn't moving to external memory induce latency and hurt performance? Well, it is true that in general, moving data further from compute can hurt performance. But as I said, not all memory and neural network training is being used the same way. Activation memory has to be accessed immediately by the next layer. It's latency sensitive, so we keep it on chip. But weight memory is used and updated relatively infrequently. There's no back-to-back -back dependencies. And the weight streaming architecture takes full advantage of this to avoid latency and performance bottlenecks. We ensure weight memory is not latency, latency sensitive by doing two things. First, we use coarse grain pipelining to avoid the dependencies between layers by scheduling the entire training as a pipeline of layers. We start streaming weights for a layer without having to wait for the previous layer to complete. As with any pipeline, this enables high performance that's not sensitive to latency. And second, to cover the dependency between training iterations, we actually overlap the weight update with the forward pass of the same layer. This forms a fine-grained pipeline of the updated weight matrix with the forward pass that's actually consuming it. And since the CS2 is processing the weights individually, we can stream out the weights immediately as they're being updated so the forward pass can proceed without having to wait for the entire weight matrix to be updated. By using these pipelining techniques, the weight streaming execution model can hide the extra latency from external weights, and we can hit the same performance as if the weights were locally on the wafer. Next, I'll describe the major components that enable weight streaming to fit these giant models. And there are two main capacity problems to be solved. The first is how do you store the giant model? And the second is how do you run that giant model on a chip? To solve the first problem of storage capacity, our architecture moves all of the model parameters into a single external device called Memory X. The Memory X architecture has configurable capacity starting from four terabytes up to 2.4 petabytes to support the full spectrum of model sizes. For models like GPT-3, four terabytes is sufficient. And scaling up to 2.4 petabytes supports up to 120 trillion models. Internally, the Memory X architecture uses both DRAM and flash storage in a hybrid fashion to achieve both high performance and capacity. It also has internal compute to perform the weight update and the optimizer functions. Just like we did for memory, we've separated out the compute that's operating on the weights to be close to the weights. Since these weight computations are extremely small compared to the main model execution, we can effectively run these on the memory X unit while the main model execution proceeds in parallel on the CS2. And lastly, memory X performs the intelligent pipeline scheduling that eliminates the impacts of latency. With this approach, we can provide flexible capacities to store up to extreme scale models. To solve the second problem of running a giant layer on chip, we rely on the uniquely massive scale of the wafer scale engine. A single Cerebrus chip is uniquely capable of fitting and running the full spectrum of layer sizes, even extremely large layers, using the exact same method, resulting in exactly the same high performance. There's no need to distribute, no need to partition, no need to coordinate. Let me show you why. Neural network layers boil down to matrix multiplication. And because of the scale of the CS2, we're able to use all 850,000 cores of the wafer as a single giant matrix multiply array. Here's how that works. 
We start with activations distributed across the wafers on chip memory. As the weights stream through, they're multiplied with the local activations. This is the main compute part of the matrix multiply. And recall, the weights are never stored on the wafers, so we don't use any of that local memory capacity. We then get full performance from the massive memory bandwidth that's feeding these data paths, and finally, the resulting partial sums are accumulated using the extremely high performance uniform fabric bandwidth across the entire wafer. There's no need to block or to partition the matrix. Because of the sheer size of the wafer, we can operate on the full range of matrix sizes without additional complexity or loss of performance. That's matrix sizes up to 100,000 by 100,000. And this is what this looks like. This graph shows the utilization we have measured in our lab across various model layer sizes. From smaller layers such as those in GPT-2 all the way up to extreme layer sizes such as GPT-3 and multi-trillion parameter models. In all of these cases with the same execution mapping and the same high utilization. In fact, as you might expect, with larger layers, the utilization actually increases because the fixed overheads are better amortized. The second key enabler to running extreme scale models is scaling performance. And we do that by clustering multiple CS2 systems through the SORMX interconnect architecture. This interconnect is specially designed to enable efficient data parallel training across multiple CS2 systems. It sits between the memory X units and the CS2 systems, but it's independent from both. SwarmX broadcasts weights to all CS2s, and it reduces gradients from all CS2s. So it's more than just an interconnect. It's an active component in the whole training process that's purpose-built for the weight streaming execution model. Internally, SwarmX uses a tree topology to enable modular and low overhead scaling, whether that's scaling to two systems or to 192 systems. Because it's modular and disaggregated, it enables scaling to multiple TS2 systems with exactly the same execution model as a single system. That's exactly the same system architecture, the same execution flow, and the same software user interface. Scaling to more compute is as simple as adding more nodes to the SORMX topology and adding more CS2s. With this interconnect architecture, in combination with the pipelining techniques I described earlier, we project near linear performance scaling from a single CS2 to 192 systems. Here's how that scaling translates to training speed up for a range of natural language model sizes from 10 billion parameters all the way to 100 trillion parameters. This is using the scaling laws for NLP networks published by OpenAI. And for reference, large language models today like GPT-3, that's around 100 to 200 billion parameters. And as you can see, the scaling is near linear and mostly falling off relatively smaller models where batch size becomes a limitation beyond a certain point. But for relatively large models, especially those extreme scale models, we expect near linear performance scaling all the way to 192 systems. Now that we've seen how we can scale both capacity and performance, we need to step back and ask ourselves, is that enough? And we'll quickly conclude that to train extreme scale models, it's not. We need smarter models. The reason is simple. The model sizes and the compute are growing exponentially, outpacing Moore's law by orders of magnitude. At this rate, we'll soon need a football field worth of silicon to run just a single model. That's not practical. So in addition to scaling the raw compute performance, we also need smarter models with better algorithmic efficiency. We need sparse models. 
where we can get the same answers, but with less compute. There's active research today in the ML community showing techniques to create sparsity, even in models that are otherwise dense. And they're showing up to 10 times flop reduction while preserving the accuracy of the models. We need to harness this potential and enable the community to innovate on yet newer and sparser models. But until now, there's no hardware that can take advantage of these forms of sparsity. GPUs and similar architectures are all dense matrix engines. But the Cerebrus architecture was designed for sparse compute from the ground up. The cores use hardware data flow scheduling to trigger computations only for non-zero data. And our massive memory and interconnect bandwidth enable us to do this at full performance, not only saving power and energy, but also achieving acceleration by skipping all of the unnecessary computations. With this architecture, we can run matrix operations at full performance across all BLAST levels. Traditional architectures with dense matrix data paths and with low memory bandwidth, they're restricted to running only GEM or matrix matrix multiplies at full performance. The Cerebrus architecture, on the other hand, enables full performance all the way down to AXP, which is a vector scalar multiply. In fact, the way we execute all matrix multiplies is by repeating that AXP based computation. And since sparse gem is just a collection of AXP operations, one for every non-zero weight, we natively accelerate any sparse matrix multiply, even for completely arbitrary unstructured sparsity. And here's how that works within weight streaming. Sparsity is induced in the weight matrix in the memory X unit by using one of the ML techniques I described. And then the sparse weights are streamed to all the CS2s. The SWARMX interconnect broadcasts them all in sparse form. And when the CS2 receives them, it performs the computation in sparse form. On the delta pass, the CS2 produces gradients, also sparse, so we're only computing gradients for non-zero weights. And those sparse gradients are streamed back out, reduced through the SWARMX interconnect and back to the memory X unit. And finally, the weight update is performed, also sparse. All of this happens natively with no change to the weight streaming model. In fact, it's exactly the same weight streaming flow we use for dense. And that exact same flow extends directly into the wafer, where the wafer acts as a giant sparse matrix multiply array. As the weights stream through, they trigger multiplication with the local activation, so one individual weight at a time. This is where we're using the fine-grained data flow mechanisms built into our cores, performing one vector scalar multiply for each non-zero weight. It's the exact same matrix multiply I described earlier, except now we natively skip all the sparse weights and we just run faster. And here are the results. In our lab, we have measured speed up for fully unstructured weight sparsity on GPT-3 size layers, all the way up to 90% sparsity, which is 10 times more zeros than non-zeros. On the right, you can see our lab results showing near linear speed up even at this extreme level of sparsity. The only limitation is really Amdahl's law and amortizing fixed overheads. But our massive memory and interconnect bandwidth, it enables us to reduce that overhead significantly as the, result, as the results show. And that overhead only reduces further as the memory, as the model grows. These, resu these results demonstrate we can accelerate fully unstructured weight sparsity, which is not possible in traditional architectures. It accelerates all types of ML sparsity algorithms already available today and enables new classes of smarter, sparser models that are actively being developed. As a community, it's through these types of innovations that we can practically reach extreme scale models.
Now, all of this performance would be for naught if it took days or weeks to program. So we designed the hardware and the software together to be easy to use. If you've used large clusters today, you'll know what I mean when I say running neural networks on distributed hardware is complicated. All the intricacies of memory partitioning, coordination, and synchronization across thousands of small devices, well, they fall onto the user. In fact, big companies often have entire engineering teams doing just this. The Cerebrus approach, on the other hand, isn't just hiding this complexity, but rather the architecture is fundamentally simple because it's well matched to the problem. A single CS2 is just inherently simpler because it's a cluster's worth of compute in a single node. The weight streaming architecture then naturally extends that usability to multiple CS2 systems. And that's because our chip is massive enough to run entire extreme scale layers without partitioning. There's no need for either software or the user to split the problem differently for small devices, whether they're connected by PCI Express versus InfiniBand versus MB-Link or Ethernet. This means that our software can map the workload to multiple systems in exactly the same way as a single system. You don't need different software when you move from running from one device to multiple devices in a single server to multiple servers in a pod. Our execution model is always the same. You just compile the neural network mapping for a single CS2. It's the same compile no matter the number of systems. You load that mapping onto each CS2 identically and you go to town. It's really that easy. So everything we've just talked through today the weight streaming execution model, the memory X storage, the SORMX interconnect. All of it, when we put it together, gives us an architecture capable of growing model capacity to 120 trillion parameters, scaling up to 163 million cores across 192 systems, and accelerating up to 10 times unstructured weight sparsity while still being easy to use. That's extreme capacity, extreme acceleration, extremely smart ML models, and extreme ease of use in a fully disaggregated, scalable architecture. With these new capabilities, just imagine what you could do. Imagine, perhaps training GPT-3 in just a day, or training a trillion parameter model in just over a long weekend, or maybe something much larger. We can't wait to find out. Thank you very much. All right, so thank you very much for that talk. I believe Sean is now here for Q&A. Uh, so we're gonna try and get a couple in from the channel. So I think one of the most popular uh, themes that I sort of see running throughout questions in the channel is uh, actually what is the, the bandwidth between a memory X uh, extender and the CS2 uh, wafer, and you know are they in the physically in the same rack or, or, or uh, uh, a different rack? Do we have a problem here? Hello? Yes. You can hear me? Hi, David. Hey, all right, sorry. Okay. I heard your question. Um, so that's a great question. So uh, so the, the memory X uh, unit um, being uh, logically and physically disaggregated doesn't actually have to be in the same rack. Um, it can be cabled in, in adjacent racks. Uh, the amount of bandwidth is over a terabit of bandwidth. Um, which is uh, uh, not just through the memory X, but also through the Swarm X interconnect. Got it. And uh, so it sounds like that interconnect is actually uh, somewhat custom to uh, Cerebrus. Is that correct? The, the, the interconnect, I would say, is a standard space interconnect. Uh, but the, the reason why 
uh, I, we're not talking about exactly what it is because it's actually not directly exposed to the user. Um, it's intended to be uh, uh, integrated into the system and uh, the, it's seamless from the user's point of view. And then uh, we had a question about sort of the uh, uh, how you handle activations for skip connections. So if you're if you're streaming in, uh, if you're trying to keep the activations resident on die, how would you handle skip connections in, in something like a ResNet or uh, other such architectures? That, that's a great question. Um, in general, all of our activations are kept on the wafer. So. Uh, residual connections um, are the same. The activations will be generated. They stay resident on the wafer, and they get picked up in in a few layers uh, when they're when they're needed. So, all right. I think unfortunately that's about all the time we have. Uh, I, I know there's a ton of questions in the channel that we were not able to get through. Uh, as with prior sessions, I'll kind of go through and apply check boxes to the one that. That I think got answered, but it would be great if uh, I know you and your team are standing by to interact. So um, absolutely, we'll we'll get to all the questions in the Slack channel. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, all right. So uh, I believe our next talk now is uh, from the folks at Samba Nova. Um, the the third of our uh, and last of our ML talks, but not the last of the session. So uh, a brief introduction here uh, to our two speakers. Uh, we have uh, Raghu Prabhakar, who's a senior principal engineer at Samba Nova. Um, he has uh, authored uh, quite a few research papers in computer architecture, programming models, and compilation for reconfigurable data flow architectures. Um, and he was one of the 12 top picks for IEEE Micro in 2017. And uh, he has co-authored a book on CGRAs. So it shouldn't really be surprising that uh, Sandro has a CGRA here. Uh, he has a PhD from Stanford and is also joined by Sumti Jairoth, uh, the chief architect at Samba Nova Systems, who has a long history of software hardware co-design. He worked on PA risk-based Superdome servers at HP, several generations of Spark uh, of course, we need multi-threading processors at Sun and Oracle. Uh, some of those were presented at the prior uh, hot chips. And then at Oracle, he actually worked on SQL data analytics and ML acceleration. And he has 14 patents in computer architecture and hardware software code design. So, uh, gentlemen, let's take it away and get going. It is... Uh... Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, well, thanks a lot, David, for the introduction. And uh, uh, I'm. Uh, it's really my privilege and honor to present the work that uh, our team at Sambunova has done uh, on uh, the SN10 RDU, which is a reconfigurable data flow unit. Um, so I'll start by uh, specifying a few things about our system at a high level. Uh, so this slide talks about some details regarding the chip. Uh, it is the first uh, reconfigurable data flow unit, or RDU, uh, taped out in uh, 2019 um, in TSMC 7 nanometer process. Um, the chip contains compute and memory elements, which enable our compiler to uh, construct very efficient data flow pipelines for the applications it's trying to run. Uh, to manage the communication for the data flow pipelines on chip, uh, we have built in quite a lot of on-chip memory bandwidth, so it's over 150 terabytes per second. Uh, so uh, one of the running themes uh, as we go forward in this talk is uh, you know, software really is, is, is the driver for most of our architectural design choices. Uh, so the amount of flexibility um, in our compute and memory units uh, is really driven by software. Uh, so this slide talks about uh, our system. So eight of the SN10 RDUs form our SN10 8R system. It's a quarter rack system. Um, uh, it's attached to uh, 12 terabytes of memory, which is about 38 times larger than uh, conventional systems, uh, which form state of the art today. And this can be upgraded, of course, to a, to a full rack. And uh, it's a, a standard data center rack, standard form factor, and uh, uh, no special requirements there. Um, and this slide talks about our SambaFlow software, which is really uh, sort of the top-down approach I was talking about earlier. 
so our compiler stack uh, is driven around really uh, ease of use, which is users build their applications using familiar higher level programming models like PyTorch, TensorFlow, or you know, other higher level APIs. Our compiler stack systematically breaks down this graph uh, and implements an efficient data flow pipeline for it automatically. So these kind of decisions include higher level scheduling choices, like running, uh, running an, uh, an application in a model parallel way, data parallel way, maybe a hybrid, depending on uh, the nature of the application. And as we go down in the stack, there are data flow specific optimizations which enable exploiting greater locality in the applications. Uh, so transformations like automatic tiling, parallelizing operations and adjusting the memory access patterns, uh, high throughput streaming uh, operations, as well as nested pipelining. Uh, and this picture shows that we, uh, going from a logical graph on the left, uh, with optimizations, we can avoid communication bottlenecks and come up with a very efficient data flow pipeline. So why, you know, I kept saying the word data flow. So there's a few next few slides are gonna talk about why we want data flow. So as we have seen in numerous presentations in this current hardships and uh, earlier, uh, we know that advances in modern machine learning uh, and you know, hence software 2.0, which is a newer way of building software, uh, has surpassed the capabilities of the older way of software. Uh, and one of the trends is that software 2.0 is also re uh, uh, you know, it's rewiring the way we think about software. The software 1.0 is mostly uh, thought of as a step-by-step -step sequence of operations you perform to accomplish a task. Software 2.0, the programming or the compute structure itself is much more amenable to data flow, where really the computation is specified as a flow of inputs to example outputs, and uh, there is a logical sequence of um, exchange of data between these few nodes. So one of the issues is while the computation is suited for data flow, our current systems are really not suited for data flow. And because of this, we see that there is a, uh, effectively a Goldilocks zone where your models can neither be too small nor too big. It has to be just right um, in terms of size in order to have high performance on uh, current systems. So this graph on the models on the left are smaller uh, compressed models or sparser models which don't tend to perform well on current hardware because of uh, utilization problems. And models on the right, which are really big, are either too big in terms of their footprint, or uh, uh, which, which makes them infeasible on current architectures, or uh, you need uh, you know, a very large number of nodes in order to accomplish a particular task. And even for the models in the middle, there is a rich design space that we're leaving on the table, and hence we're leaving performance on the table. So what does data flow give us? So here is an example of two uh, uh, math operators which are quite common, softmax and layer norm. And the diagrams on the right show how the computation of layer norm is captured internally within the compiler, within our compiler. So the orange boxes here show the compute operations and the way they can be parallelized. Um, the blue boxes show uh, memories, uh, their access patterns and uh, you know, data locality. So as we can see, there is actually a natural flow, even at the level of an individual node, there is a natural flow of data, which the compiler has knowledge of and can do something useful with. So our design decisions behind the SN10 RDU are based around how do we enable our compiler stack in order to exploit the inherent data locality and inherent parallelism at multiple levels efficiently. So with that, I'm going to talk uh, uh, over the next few slides, uh, provide a little more detail about uh, the SN10 RDU itself. So this picture on the left shows a higher level uh, block diagram of the SN10 chip. It consists of four tiles, where each tile is really a sea of reconfigurable compute, memory, and uh, interconnect components. Now the tiles can be independently resource managed or they can be uh, uh, ganged together to form a larger tile for, uh, from software. So all the tiles can access off-chip uh, memory, uh, which is uh, DRAM, or can access host memory uh, or other RDUs via DDR and PCIe. So let's zoom into a single tile. Now, 
the diagram shown here is uh, and on the right side shows the the key components that we form uh, that forms a particular uh, tile. Uh, so we have PCUs which form the compute workhorse, PMUs which form our on-chip memory systems, switches which are really our programmable interconnect fabric, and then AGCUs on the left side which show uh, our off-chip interface and our interface to the I/O subsystem. So one key takeaway from this is that our compiler is able to scale the compute and memory requirements required for constructing a data flow graph independently. So the amount of compute or memory required for, you know, uh, for different data flow graphs, they may not scale linearly, um, and uh, the architecture is able to uh, provide the flexibility required. With that, let's talk about what a PCU is, pattern compute unit. So this is our SN you know, main compute engine. Um, it's form, the core of it is really a sequence of uh, ALUs. It's arranged in uh, pipeline stages, and each stage can, can exploit SIMD parallelism. Now, we support different kinds of formats. Uh, and in addition, in order to take advantage of uh, dense operations, where we want to keep all the ALUs busy, uh, such as dense matrix multiplies and convolutions, uh, PCUs support systolic modes of execution, uh, which keeps, uh, which, which is able to give us uh, high teraflops utilization. Uh, the PMU is our on-chip programmable memory system. Uh, so this has, uh, in order to feed the beast, in order to feed the PCUs, we need to be able to produce addresses at a very high throughput for arbitrary access patterns that are common in real-world applications, and uh, be able to sustain reads and writes at the same time. Because typically in a data flow pipeline, uh, you are writing and reading different uh, iterations to the same memory at the same time. Uh, we also have uh, data alignment units, which give us, which allows our compiler to map complex operations like transpose, permute, uh, as well as high throughput gathers and scatters. Our on-chip switch network is really the, the freeway system on-chip. So this is our uh, interconnections between PCUs and PMUs. Uh, it's not really just nearest neighbor. Uh, we can construct, uh, our compiler can construct arbitrary uh, routes through the switch fabric. And finally, the address generator and coalescing units, which form our off-chip interface. And similar to the PMUs, AGCUs also have uh, address ALUs, which allow software the compiler to program any arbitrary access pattern uh, at high throughput. And this also allows transparent scale out. So as we scale to multiple RDUs, uh, AGCUs allow a transparent scale out between uh, the chips. So let's revisit the same programming model uh, diagram again. So I wanted to go over a couple of examples on how we end up mapping operations like these from the compiler to the architecture. So we'll start with softmax. Uh, so here at the bottom, we, I have the sort of the floor plan or the architecture diagram for uh, the SN10. And one way to map it is as I've shown here, where all the memory units, X, M, R, and O in the diagram are mapped into PMUs. All the orange blocks, uh, the exponent, sum, and divide are mapped to the PCUs. And the communication between them are programmed as routes by the compiler using switches. So this allows a fully pipelined implementation of uh, a softmax operation. But this is not really the only way. So if I take the second example of layer norm, and I use the same methodology where we want to fully pipeline the implementation, uh, the mapping would look like this. But on the other hand, uh, depending on what the real application requires, we may want to save on compute resources. We may want to scale back on compute resources to use it for other operations. So we can repurpose uh, the same compute unit and execute multiple operations in the same compute unit in parallel in the PCU. So we can go one step further and say, well, we want to, uh, you know, the compiler wants to use fewer resources for the layer norm by saving both compute and memory. So it can, it can uh, repurpose the same PCU as well as PMU uh, and achieve the same operation. So this trade-off of space and time exists and our compiler can automatically take advantage of this. And this unlocks a whole new design space uh, for mapping uh, all these models. So if we up-level the same idea, and we see how we map, uh, how these models are executed today, we have the convolution graph. Um, it's an example graph that you see on the top. 
So today, we take each individual operator, like a conv, a pool, conv2, and each operator is executed uh, sequentially, uh, where we use the entire hardware resource to, to run just that one layer or that one operation. This requires us to materialize intermediate results to, uh, to memory. And in order to achieve high utilization, it puts pressure on the on-chip uh, on off memory system to, uh, to have high bandwidth. Now, on the other hand, there is really another way to implement it. So the data flow way is to not necessarily uh, uh, implement it in uh, you know, a kernel by kernel with method as I've shown on the left side. We can construct a data flow pipeline where individual operators can uh, coexist on the chip and hence increase utilization. So there are a couple of things we, that we are achieving here. One is because we are able to uh, keep multiple operators on chip, automatically from the compiler. This is effectively achieving automatic kernel fusion. So there is no need for users, libraries, uh, to hand fuse frequently occurring operators and then have a maintenance backlog of all these operators. The compiler can automatically achieve the same effect. Second thing is we are able to capture all these intermediate values as with, which have temporal and spatial locality on chip. They don't have to be materialized and with tiling, they don't even have to be materialized on chip. So because of this, we are able to utilize our I.O. bandwidth much more efficiently, uh, due to which there is no reliance on things like high bandwidth memory. And at the same time, also get high performance and high utilization. Just to give another example, uh, this is another uh, workload, a real workload that, that we have worked on, uh, where I wanted to introduce how you know, sparse and dense computations can simultaneously coexist. So unlike, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, there's no need to fuse or have handwritten fused kernels to, uh, to implement uh, high performance operators. So this particular example has a sparse matrix multiply followed by a traditional neural network, which involves a dense matrix multiply. Our compiler is automatically able to partition them and uh, you know, group the sparse and dense multiplies into one uh, unit, which can be executed on chip, effectively fusing the two operators together. And if we zoom into how the sparse matrix multiply is, uh, is executed, we really have, uh, you know, instead of thinking about it as a custom kernel, which is optimized um, for, you know, uh, you know, in a very specific way, it's really a data flow of primitive elements combined together, primitive components combined together. So we have implemented sparse matrix multiply as you know, a, a high throughput gather operation followed by a, a high throughput uh, uh, element wise multiplication and accumulation. So by constructing sparse matrix multiply and other kernels as a combination of primitives this way, along with our ability to automatically fuse kernels, um, uh, which is, you know, comes natural to data flow, we are able to have high utilizations and high performance even with, uh, uh, you know, without handwritten optimizations. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Sumti, who will talk about our uh, scale out and some uh, uh, use cases that we have. Thank you. Thank you, Raghu. Uh, so Raghu just introduced data flow architecture at Sambanova. And this is like a quick summary of uh, what all data flow architectures start to unlock uh, at a system, software, and the application level. I'll add to these capabilities in, in the talk further, and then uh, also describe that how our customers uh, are using these machines and, and type of applications that get deployed. So memory, uh, we've heard enough at tutorials. We have heard enough today in the previous talks. Uh, certainly not a surprise to anybody in 2021 that uh, these neural networks require a lot of memory. Uh, but what, what I and Raghu have been talking is, is this is our first generation 2017 design. And the key goal that Sambanova started with was exact same realization that, that you want to solve these three problems together. The compute, uh, the data flow efficiency, and right amount of memory that uh, should be provided in these machine learning accelerators so that you can work on these problems uh, in an efficient way. Uh, 
And it's not really putting together the piles of these compute and memory separated. It, they have to be interleaved in a fine-grained manner such that neither of them is too far from each other and, and you can use it uh, in the right proportion. Uh, so what data flow, as Raghu was describing, enables for us is that uh, the, the I/O efficiency as well, because we can we can schedule the operations in compiler accordingly. What it allows us is to attach a large amount of memory to each of the RDU. So here I'm showing a, a rough block diagram of one SN10 8R, eight RDUs in there, and each one of those RDUs is connected with one and a half terabyte of memory. So that's already an order of magnitude higher than what usually you get in a, in a state-of-the-art device. But we don't stop there. Uh, data flow, as Raghu was describing, really, it's just seeing PCUs and PMUs. These are the compute elements and the, and the memory elements. And whether they are on the local chip or the remote chip with the communication all in our control, we can extend the models in a model parallel way, uh, all by the compiler. That's how it is seeing it. Uh, onto the eight devices as well. So, so overall, memory available to a single program uh, without any changes in the code is 12 terabyte, which makes it roughly around two orders of magnitude higher memory that otherwise, if you're trying to code a program or a network on a state-of-the-art device, uh, what you'll see is like tens of uh, gigabyte of memory uh, otherwise. So, so with that programming model and the capability in your hand, how um, how customers are using this machine. So you can certainly uh, use it like the way uh, in the in the bottom picture. There are eight RDUs. You have a need for large amount of compute and memory, and uh, you just tell the compiler that for this particular application, I want to give you the whole machine, eight RDUs. It it just pretty much compiles the graph for for that capability. Or you could use it in a in a other extreme way, which is each of the RDU is fully virtualized. You can use it in a multi-tenant way. You can fire up your application per tile basis. So overall, as a multi-user um, use of this machine, uh, to the user it is like one to 32 tiles present. You can pick any configuration in between, ask the compiler, compile it, and it'll run the application. Uh, first, first picture here is a little bit interesting. You can also stitch multiple compute graphs together as it's showing that it's not really just designed for machine learning only. Uh, it, the, the input to the machine is a compute graph uh, enabled with, with large amount of memory and the communication efficiency. So you can stitch uh, your pre-processing graph with the training graph and uh, on the output of it, you could be doing the SQL operation. So all of that, you can just schedule on, on the device as well. And with your application, that way on the, on the single node, from there on, you can just replicate it on the racks of hardware for scale out uh, part. There, the normal um, MP, DP, or uh, the hybrid approaches, they just work fine. You just control it from your Todd distributed or, or the framework of your choice. So what do we start to get with, uh, with this uh, then? So the language models. Again, we heard enough on the, the tutorials and today that all these models are uh, ranging anywhere from 200, billion, uh, 200 million parameters to multi-trillion, three and a half trillion other day. We saw the, the blog. Um, and to be able to just even try these models on any machine, this is a pain uh, we have to go through today, which is showing in the, in the left-hand side, where all of the system engineering effort required, all of the model re-architecture effort required to be able to fit these pieces into the into the hardware you have all of the compromises around the machine learning architecture that how do i hide the uh, the accuracy problems that result from the compromises made because of delayed updates and everything else uh, if you have enough memory on the machine this is where the ease of use part comes in just to get on the machine and starting to explore the the new Ar architecture uh, you pretty much get in there whether the model is 200 million parameter or 200 billion or multi-trillion. It's push of a button, compiler sees it in the same way, it just applies its optimization. So you pick the model out of PyTorch, or, or uh, you write in PyTorch, or pick it from Hugging Face, uh, push the button, start exploring, uh, no, no accuracy compromises are done that way. So ease of use, total focus on the, on the developer efficiency, 
and not really worrying about uh, re-architecting all these all these apps. And as we're talking about memory, like in a way that yes, you can do certain tricks where I can put weights at one place and activation at another place and so on, works for certain model. Our idea was to keep it totally flexible. Once you have distributed this memory compute and communication in a fine-grained way, works for whole range of models. So it's not just the NLP that's demanding uh, this type of behavior. So this is like computer vision models. All the commercial space want to be around 4K to 8K images. All the uh, all the scientific computing want to be around 50K by 50K resolution versus today's machine constrain you to the, the lower resolution. And to be able to do it on the on the devices today, what you have to do is a lot of information loss. Downsample it, tile it, run it kernel by kernel on the device versus on RDU based system, it is just take the full sample uh, at full resolution, pass it through, uh, it just sits next uh, to it, and then the full computational graph runs on, on this. And in this case, activations are big, like uh, parameters in this case are not really big, so you need something very close. And the results out of box are excellent. So this is one of the runs uh, actually done very early in 2020 uh, when machines, uh, we powered up machines in 20, late 2019, pretty much these are the models that we started running. Uh, accuracy jump that you see because it was getting run as a 4, 4x downsampled uh, versus when you run it at full resolution, you, you straight away see the, the jump in uh, overall perform, uh, accuracy here. And it's not just uh, the the machine learning models which are uh, which need this high compute efficiency and large memory. Pretty much AI for science or HPC. Uh, again, the same thing. Excellent amount of work going on there. Whether it's a density functional theory, finite differences, molecular modeling, all these applications active uh, on on uh, Samanova hardware and and customers using it actively. And these are all data flow in nature. Need ton of memory work as good as any of the machine learning models out there. So with that, what should you expect from such a machine? That that what's going on? This is a picture Raghu started with. Uh, 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 he showed that what kind of problems are in each one of these segments, what should you expect? So middle is all about out-of-box performance. Like you can tune the, the one single model, two models, three models, but you can't do it for 1,000, 10,000 models which are out there. So when you pick a model out of GitHub, press the button, when all those optimizations which are done by hand otherwise on, on, on state-of-the-art machines, when they can happen automatically, what you get is two to five X uh, better results. Uh, Left-hand side is all about the, the kernel scheduling uh, inefficiencies, the, the round-trip time that goes in there. So sparse applications because of on-chip memory bandwidth as well as the graph execution, they run much better. And right-hand side is uh, all about the big models, which are which uh, basically, as I described in a few of the examples, that just out-of-box uh, run uh, with ease of use and as well as you can train them uh, at that efficiency. And with that, this is my last slide. If a uh, few bunch of links here, which uh, are pointing towards, if you want to see the results on particular workloads, go on to our blogs. Uh, a ton of results shared there. Uh, architecture in much more detail. A white paper out there. Certainly, our products, Dataflow as a service, and and the uh, uh, and and the data scale. And and certainly, we are hiring. Uh, uh, with that, I like to conclude our talk and uh, hand it back to, to David for Q&A. Thank you very much. So, uh, we're going to now dive into Q&A. So, if you have any questions, uh, questions into the Slack channel, uh, we'll try and uh, get to those. Um, so, I think uh, uh, I'm going to start with a question from Ratika Borkar from NVIDIA. Uh, what is the bandwidth supported at the switch units per direction? Can you uh, give us a little bit more detail there on the uh, on die fabric? And I, I think Manoj Rui from Synopsis also has some questions in this direction. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure if I can give you the exact number, but uh, there's enough bandwidth to sustain uh, the throughput to enable you know, high throughput streaming access from uh, PCUs to PMUs and back. 
I think I'll say there we did not leave any room for mistake. There is more than what you think it'll be there. That 150 terabyte per second was memories. And from there, you can calculate that how much switches uh, have the bandwidth. They, they can stream at full bandwidth, all of that. And 50 kilometers of wire warp, by the way, for, for that only. <laughs> Got it. All right. And um, then uh, uh, another question uh, also, uh, I guess, from Rutika. Uh, how long does it take to compile the popular models? You know, something like a Resident 50 or Burt Large, right? especially given that it's, you know, clearly you're requiring a high degree of spatial. Yes, yeah, so those are pretty quick. Uh, so Burt Large and uh, uh, ResNet, uh, it's a, like a minute or two. Uh, the large models uh, like GPT-175 billion or anything like that, those were starting to become a problem, but they have a a repetitive structure. So once our compiler deployed the repetitive structure, it just compiles one segment of it, replicate. So they start to show up in in uh, about the same times as well. Perfect. All right. And then uh, uh, Ian Cutters of Amantech uh, wants to know what uh, is the memory bandwidth uh, that you support uh, across those DDR4 channels. So that is on the actually system slide, so all the DDR channels, uh, so six channels per RDU DDR4 and uh, all eight RDUs, so overall uh, 48 channels there. Right, and is that DDR4 3200 or something faster or so? Uh, all, all ranges supported in different configs, so 2667 to 3200. I noticed that both uh, uh, you, your team, and streamers are also focusing on trillion parameter, trillion parameter models in a single chassis. Um, and he wants to know if uh, you guys could share a time estimate of how long it might take to train a trillion parameter model. Yeah, good question. And then, so uh, what is happening there is that it. The, the model itself uh, makes has no meaning. It's like on what data set, right? So in a way that you could have a 2 billion tokens or you could have like 200 billion tokens and, and what data set it is. Uh, what matters for us is the efficiency at which we are able to run these models. So nowadays I'll say 200 billion, very common. Those things are running. Trillion parameter models, likely the direction they are going are in the sparser nature, like MOEs you see, that mixture of experts. And those models remain at the compute, which is about the same as what GPT-3 had, and and uh, you run it that way. So a lot of variation there. Uh, I think just saying a number without the, the context of data, which architecture, it, it won't make much sense there. But but those things are running all, all great. All right, perfect. Well, I think we're out of time for questions. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for the, uh, the great talk. And this is you know, the first real technical talk on uh, Oh, I'm sorry, so we're chosen out of here. Uh, I hope you'll stick around and answer some questions in the Slack. Yep, sure. So, yeah, yep. Uh, in the meantime, we're going to turn to our fourth and last talk. Uh, and this is, uh, uh, this is a joint talk. We have uh, sort of two speakers. Uh, Jay Adam Butts is, leads the physical design team at DEFAR Research. Uh, although he's also known to cause trouble in other parts of the organization. Prior to DE Shaw, where he spent 15 years, he worked on processors at IBM Research and Intel. He is a fellow of the Hertz Foundation and also serves as an interviewer there. He has a PhD in computer science from UW-Madison and degrees in chemistry, physics, and electrical engineering from the University of Illinois at Grand Champaign. He will be presenting the talk. The Q&A will be handled uh, by Brandon Batson, who I'll introduce at a later time. Uh, I'd also like to mention that, you know, this is uh, 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 a molecular dynamics computational platform, uh, unlike our prior ML ones, but is, again, a great example of what can be accomplished with software or co-design. And one of the things that I actually found particularly impressive in, in talking to, to Brandon and Adam about this ahead of time is the team's actually very, very, very small. You'll get to see it all in the names on the first slide. But, uh, you know, it doesn't take half a billion dollars to design a cutting edge, fantastic, special purpose uh, computational platform. This is a, a, a great case in point. So 
without further ado, let's uh, start rolling the video and, and then we can turn to questions at the conclusion. Hi, I'm Adam Butts with DE Shaw Research, and today I will be presenting the Anton 3 ASIC, a fire breathing monster for molecular dynamic simulations. I'm privileged to be presenting today on behalf of the entire hardware team who worked on the Anton 3 project. While the 40 odd people here listed may seem like a lot, they were collectively responsible for all of architecture and logic design, design verification, physical design, mechanical and system engineering, and manufacturing and project management. Before I can discuss what Anton 3 is, I need to begin with some background on what it does. In biochemistry, structure and function are intimately connected. Dozens of Nobel Prizes have been awarded for the determination of the structures of important biomolecules and the techniques that have made that possible. Yet these are almost entirely static snapshots. Given how little time we spend at absolute zero, atoms move. Moreover, many biochemical systems are actually molecular scale machines. Ion channels open and close, molecular motors spin, and RNA is read like paper tape into ribosomes for translation into proteins. Molecular dynamics allows us to model these motions to gain scientific insight. The result of an MD simulation, called a trajectory, might be rendered into a ribbon diagram like the one shown on this slide. This particular example showed a small molecule within the ACE2 protein, notable as the binding target of SARS-CoV-2's infamous spike. Scientists can gain insight from such a rendering, much as this audience might from a block diagram or schematic. But the underlying data includes knowledge of every atom's position over the course of the simulation, including those in the water solvent. MD simulations compute the evolving positions of these atoms by numerical integration of Newton's laws of motion. Forces among thousands to millions of atoms are computed according to physics-based models that describe interatomic energy potentials. These forces are integrated over discrete time steps of just a few femtoseconds to determine new positions and velocities for the atoms, a process repeated billions of times to generate trajectories at time scales of interest. The force computation at the heart of the MD simulation is described by a model called a force field, and it will be helpful to understand the major components of a representative one. We'll start with a familiar electrostatic force between charged particles. Atoms within the simulation are assigned charges, which are parameters of the models. Then the force between any pair of particles is proportional to the product of their charges divided by the square of their separation. Computing the interactions among all pairs of particles scales poorly. So the total force is rewritten as a sum of explicit pairwise interactions out to a cutoff radius, plus a distant contribution from charges beyond. That latter contribution can be expressed as a convolution, which may be computed efficiently on a grid by multiplication in Fourier space. Of course, there is more to the force field than the electrostatic interaction. Quantum mechanical effects are approximated through forces representing the topological connections implied by chemical bonds, and the van der Waals force, which acts between pairs of atoms, but falls off quickly enough with distance that a range-limited computation is sufficiently accurate. Versus solving the underlying quantum mechanical equations, such a model reduces the problem of long timescale simulation from intractable to merely ridiculous. To make this technique accessible for high-throughput scientific work, we've turned to specialization. In 2008, we introduced the Anton supercomputer for the acceleration of all atom molecular dynamic simulations, and shortly thereafter, completed a millisecond scale simulation of a small protein, a feat unmatched to this day by any general purpose processor or GPU, even at supercomputer scale. Five years later, we debuted Anton 2 with vastly increased performance and utility, extending the family's performance lead over all available alternatives. You can see that substantial innovation was involved. Well, you can read about it at least. But this raises the obvious question for Anton 3. What color will its logo be? Fortunately, the hardware team did not have to answer that difficult question. We just had to deliver another significant leap in MD performance and capability. To understand the innovations we've made in Anton 3, let's start with a look inside the current world leader, Anton 2. Like all members of the Anton family, Anton 2 is built around a custom ASIC. Peeking under the lid, we find that most of the chip comprises two kinds of computation tiles. The flexible subsystem, or flex tile, looks like a typical multi-core processor, consisting of four cores with private caches connected to a shared memory. We call these geometry cores due to their special facility for the vector geometric computations occurring frequently in MD code. 
A dispatch unit handles fine grain synchronization and a network interface connects the flex tile to the rest of the chip and machine. The high throughput interaction subsystem, or HTIS tile, looks a lot less familiar. The HTIS is dominated by an array of pairwise point interaction modules, or PPIMs. Each PPIM contains a pair of unrolled arithmetic pipelines, the PPIPs, which compute forces between pairs of interacting atoms. The PPIPs also participate in the distant force computation by spreading charges onto grid points and interpolating grid forces back onto atoms. The interaction control block, or ICB, organizes the streaming of positions into the PPIM array and the unloading of the accumulated forces back out. Finally, a miniature version of a flex tile performs command and control functions. The periphery of the chip contains the CERTES channels that interconnect the Anton 2 ASICs, I.O. interfaces for connections to a host machine, and an on-chip logic analyzer. So what do we need to do to improve upon the high watermark set by Anton 2? Scaling up performance means more force computation throughput. Obviously, we have to cram a lot more computational resources into the Anton 3 chip for both pairwise interactions and flexible computation. Of course, if throwing more compute at a single problem was sufficient to accelerate its solution, computer architecture would be a lot less difficult. Thus, we also have to address the performance bottlenecks exposed by accelerating the force computations. Computing bonds in GC code is one such bottleneck, and the limited scaling of off-chip communication bandwidth is another. Besides making the machine faster, we also wanted to increase its capability, supporting larger simulations, making it easier to program, and supporting new force field features within the arithmetic pipelines. Finally, given that our design team is definitely not a scaling according to Moore's law, we need to control the complexity of the design and implementation. Let's begin looking at how Anton 3 accomplishes these objectives. I'll start by introducing the Anton 3 core tile, which distills all of the main components required for the MD computation into a handful of unique blocks. A central router provides on-chip network connections among a large array of such tiles. The GC and the PPIM are familiar from Anton 2, although they have undergone important evolution. The Anton 3 PPIM implements new functional forms to support a broader range of force fields. Memory capacity per GC has doubled, enabling larger simulations and more flexible software. Further optimization has been performed on the GC's instruction set, including the addition of new instructions. Additionally, a denser encoding has increased the effective capacity of the GC's instruction cache. Besides these evolutionary changes, more significant changes have also occurred here, not least of which is the co-location of flexible and specialized compute resources into the same tile. Anton 3 supports bidirectional communication between the GCs and PPIMs, allowing for new use models involving fine-grained cooperation of the PPIMs high throughput pair selection and the GCs programmability. The bond computation bottleneck has been relieved by introducing a new specialized pipeline for bonded force computation. Pairwise interaction throughput per unit area is doubled thanks to a novel decomposition of the range-limited interactions. Finally, synchronization functionality is now distributed between the memory and network, eliminating the need for a separate dispatch unit. I'd like to dive in a little more deeply on two of these innovations, starting with the bond computation. As I mentioned previously in connection with the force field, bond terms are simple models of the complex quantum mechanical behavior of atoms interacting through chemical bonds. These figures show common bond terms shared by many force fields, which model relationships among two to four topologically connected atoms. Each of these bond terms may be described in terms of a scalar internal coordinate that is derived from the positions of the participating atoms. Thus, a stretch term is expressed in terms of a bond length, an angle term in the angle between two bonds, and the dihedral term in the angle of rotation around the central bond in a four atom chain. Potential functions for each of these coordinates result in forces among the atoms participating in the corresponding bond. The Anton 3 bond calculator computes each of these common bond terms efficiently in hardware, work formerly performed by hand-tuned GC code. The operation of the bond calculator is simple in principle. Compute the internal coordinate from the atomic positions of the participating atoms. Apply per bond parameters to compute a force acting on the internal coordinate, for example, the spring-like force along a stretch bond acting on its length and transform that force back onto the constituent atoms. The hardware deals with additional details, such as caching positions and accumulating forces on sets of atoms that participate in multiple bonds, and making efficient use of shared arithmetic hardware and computing the various kinds of bond terms. 
The Anton-3 bond calculator keeps bonds off the critical path of the force computation, increases availability of the GC for other work, and reduces overall energy per time step by about 20% using only 3% of the total die area. Yeah. The second innovation I'd like to highlight is the partitioning of the range-limited force computation, which is motivated by two observations. First, the volume of a sphere increases with the cube of its radius. Equivalently, the number of atoms within a certain distance of a central atom scales with a cube of that distance. Second, taking the electrostatic force again as an example, the magnitude of the force falls according to the familiar inverse square law. Thus, computing the forces between nearby atoms demands more dynamic range as well as more complex arithmetic hardware due to the higher deviation from linearity in this region. Anton-3 exploits this fact by partitioning the range-limited interactions into near and far sets and computing them on different pipelines. Big PPIPs handle the near interactions that require the highest precision and most complex computations, but are few in number. These are analogous to the full capability pipelines that handled all range-limited interactions on Anton-2. Small PPIPs, occupying only one-third as much area each, are instantiated in larger numbers to handle the correspondingly larger number of far interactions much more efficiently. I want to emphasize that this partitioning should not be confused with the gridded distant force computation that occurs for particles beyond the cutoff radius. Both the big and small PPIPs handle particles within the cutoff radius and both compute explicit pairwise interactions. At a ratio of three small PPIPs to one big PPIP, which is pretty close to optimal, four pairwise interactions can be computed with the same area as two big PPIPs, doubling interaction throughput per unit area. Having discussed some highlights of the quartile's computational capabilities, it is now time to discuss how communication has been improved to keep up. Many of the communication optimizations made in Anton-3 are embodied in its other major constituent tile, the edge tile. Again, there are evolutionary changes, such as a more than doubling of the off-chip CERDES data rate, and reductions in inter-node hop latency. However, more significant changes were also made here. First, the edge tiles implement a network completely separate than the one that interconnects the core tiles. This edge network handles the routing of traffic that exits the core network to the correct off-chip channel, simplifying the core network routers. The edge network also allows inter-ASIC traffic to avoid entering the core networks at all when traversing intermediate hops. A second novel feature implemented in the edge tile is MD-specific link layer compression that leverages the smooth changes in atomic coordinates over time. Together with a special encoding scheme, compression increases the effective bandwidth of the off-chip channels by an additional factor of two. Finally, the edge tiles, along with the p-pins, implement a novel interaction method. In a nutshell, an interaction method dictates where range-limited interactions should be computed when partitioning simulation space across multiple nodes essentially choreographing the internode communication. Anton-3's new interaction method is more bandwidth efficient and better balanced across dimensions than prior alternatives, while also facilitating better overlap of communication with computation. With the core and edge tiles in hand, we are ready to build up an Anton-3 chip. Shown here are the layout views of each of the tiles. Both tiles are arranged around routers in the center. Starting with the core tile, I'd like to first point out the small size of the bond calculator, only about a quarter the size of a single GC. Thanks to the offloading of some routing complexity into the edge tile, the core network router is also compact, which is especially important given the large number of core tiles on the chip. The large private caches evident in the GC prevent misses during the critical inner loop of the MD simulation. Also visible is the subdivision of each p-pin into four p-pips, one big and three small. Moving over to the edge tile, the compression and link layer logic is contained within the channel receive and transmit blocks. The ICBs, like those in Anton-2, contain large memories to store positions for streaming across the PPIM array in the core tiles. While the edge tile height matches that of the core tile, it is slightly wider. Its width and its apparent lower placement density is a consequence of the vertical routing track demands of the edge network. The core tiles are placed in an array of 12 rows by 24 columns. Two columns of edge tiles bracket the core tiles completing the Anton-3 tile array. As in Anton-2, the periphery of the chip houses the CERDES phys, a logic analyzer, visible in the lower left, and the host interface, visible in the lower right. Besides the channelless abutted layout involving a small number of unique blocks we've just seen, Anton-3 boasts some other notable physical design features. First, Anton-3's high clock rate is supported by a global low-skew clock mesh over the tile array maximizing useful cycle time. 
Second, network routing was engineered at the chip level to optimize latency and routing density and push down into the block floor plans. This approach minimized hop distance and dead area while decoupling the on-chip network timing from the block implementation. The architecture supports running with an arbitrary number of core tile columns disabled in order to cope with manufacturing defects and parametric yield loss due to variation. Only a tiny fraction of the logic within the core net router must be functional to pass traffic through a disabled column. Finally, the high power dissipation demanded attention at all levels of the implementation. Front end decoupling capacitors, as well as MIMCAP, were filled to the maximum extent possible. The core power grid is contiguous across the entire chip in all metal layers, with the topmost low resistivity layers used almost exclusively for power distribution. Finally, Excepting areas over the SIRDES, FIES, and the host interface, the entire chip is covered with power supply bumps at the maximum possible density. This slide summarizes Anton 3 in numbers. Anton 3's increased computational throughput is most evident in the huge increase in the number of GCs and PPIMs. The specific numbers depend on the active core column count. 22 columns are assumed here. On-chip memory capacity and consequently maximum simulation capacity have each grown more than an order of magnitude. A clock rate of 2.8 GHz helps both throughput and latency, while raw channel bandwidth has more than doubled. Both of these important parameters have headroom left for improvement. A nearly 16x increase in transistor count was supported by the 7 nanometer FinFET process and a modest increase in die size relative to Anton 2. Typical ASIC power dissipation is just under twice that of Anton 2 at 360 watts, although it is almost identical when normalized for die area and frequency. Okay, now for the fun part, pictures. The Anton 3 chip taped out in the spring of 2020, not quite avoiding the earliest effects of the pandemic. Still, the first loose chips arrived on schedule in our lab in the, on the morning of September 29th. Less than nine hours later, we were running successful MD simulations of water boxes in socket test stations, kicking off our bring up work. The very next day saw our first simulation of a protein on Anton 3, which was limited to 250 megahertz clock frequency by the challenging thermal environment of the air-cooled socket station. In spite of this limitation, Anton 3 single chip performance at that point exceeded that of a full speed Anton 2. A month later on Halloween, we achieved our first multi-node simulation with the interconnection of two socketed chips. While invaluable during bring up, however, the socket test stations are not destined to scale any, beyond, any further beyond two nodes. In production machines, the Anton 3 ASICs are mounted onto node boards, where the ASIC appears prominently in the top center. Connectors on the edge of the node board engage with a backplane, providing power and connections to other ASICs and to the host computer. Most of the rest of the node board supports the various power supplies needed by the chip, dominated by the core power regulator designed in-house and capable of delivering over 500 watts to the ASIC. Each node board is paired with a daughter card called the Node Control Complex, or NCC. An embedded processor on the NCC performs low bandwidth control functions, such as power supply sequencing and environmental monitoring. The ASIC host interface connects to an interface FPGA on the NCC for boot, test, and protocol translation. This FPGA presents a PCIe interface to a data processor, which runs an embedded Linux distribution and bridges the Anton 3 ASIC to the outside world via Ethernet. Most of these components are covered by a water-cooled cold plate to form a complete node board assembly, as shown here on the right. Fully assembled node boards are inserted vertically into cages, each of which support 32 node boards in two rows. Shown here are two cages populated with node boards, which were the first eight node machines operational in our lab. The next milestone in our bring up effort was the completion of a 64 node machine, two of which fit in a single rack as shown here. Earlier this summer, we completed the first full size 512 node Anton 3 machine, spanning four racks. Each of the three machine sizes shown here uses a unique backplane to minimize cabling complexity within the high-speed inter-ASIC network. Like previous Anton machines, the Anton 3 inter-ASIC network is topologically a 3D torus, which is a perfect match for the simulation geometry. Every node connects to each of its six Cartesian neighbors, each through 16 bidirectional SERDES links. Shown here is the physical realization of the Anton 3 network in the 512 node machine. X-dimension connections, shown in red in the figure, are completed entirely within the backplanes. As there are 64 loops of eight ASICs each in the torus, each of the 16 backplanes contains four such loops. The green Y-dimension connections are completed partially within the backplanes and partially via the green vertical cables between adjacent cages. 
The z-dimension connections are routed exclusively in cables. Yellow vertical intercage cables within the end racks, as well as blue horizontal inter-rack cables. All told, the full 512 node Anton 3 machine has a bisection bandwidth of about 120 terabits per second. To handle its high power density, Anton 3 is water cooled. Dripless quick disconnect fittings connect supply and return water to the node board cold plate. These connect through holes in the back plane to a pair of horizontal supply and return manifolds in the back of each cage. The horizontal manifolds are connected in turn to a single set of vertical manifolds for the rack. Hoses under a raised floor bring water to a coolant distribution unit, or CDU, which contains pumps and a heat exchanger, completing the secondary coolant loop. Up to five Anton 3 racks can share a single CDU. Heat from the secondary loop is transferred to the facility's chilled water. At over 100 kilowatts per Anton 3 rack, the pumps needed in the primary loop to support multiple Anton 3 machines in a data center are pretty impressive. Overall, the cooling system ensures junction temperatures of under 65 degrees centigrade at an ASIC power of 500 watts. So, how does Anton 3 perform? We express MD performance in microseconds of simulated time per day of wall clock time for simulations with varying numbers of atoms. Note that we have to use a log scale to make sensible performance comparisons, especially over the wide range of simulation sizes we support. Anton 3's highest performing competitor is an NVIDIA A100, a relatively late model GPU, running Desmond, our in-house optimized MD code. On a chip-for-chip -chip basis, an Anton 3 is about 20 times faster than the A100. This is not to pick on NVIDIA. The A100 is a tremendously capable compute engine. Rather, this illustrates the tremendous benefit we achieve from specialization. As a point of historical interest, a single-chip Anton 3 supports almost the same maximum capacity as the original Anton 1 supercomputer with 512 nodes. Moreover, it's actually faster over most of that range while consuming just 1 50th the power. Anton 3 represents the first Anton machine for which a single node is likely to be a useful size for scientific work. For example, at 113,000 atoms, the simulation of ACE2 that I showed early in the presentation fits quite comfortably on a single node Anton 3, turning in performance more than an order of magnitude better than possible on a GPU. A distinguishing feature of Anton, however, is that it does scale to higher node counts. Shown here is Anton 3's peak performance. Below about 100,000 atoms, this exceeds 200 microseconds per day using just 64 nodes. Thus, millisecond scale simulations are possible inside a work week. The full sized 512 node machine maintains over 100 microseconds a day out to simulation sizes larger than 1 million atoms and supports simulations beyond 50 million atoms. At its capacity limit, Anton 3 turns in performance comparable to a GPU's absolute speed limit, even though Anton is simulating more than 10,000 times the number of atoms. What about using multiple GPUs? It doesn't help. It turns out that the best reported multi-GPU MD performance is lower than the single GPU performance shown here. Until systems become very large, splitting a simulation across multiple GPUs does not currently yield enough benefit to repay the cost of internode communication. Versus even Anton 2, still the world leader, Anton 3 is capable of running more than an order of magnitude faster. Even for small latency-dominated systems, Anton 3 is more than twice as fast as Anton 2, using only one-eighth the number of nodes. Anton 3 is more than 100 times faster than any non-Anton competitor, including some of the world's largest supercomputers across nearly its entire capacity range. These performance results, expressed in factors rather than percentages over its competitors, inspired the hardware team to dub it a fire-breathing monster. Of course, no hardware can succeed without software, support, and users, so I'd like to close by acknowledging all of the other non-hardware teams at Desres who were and continue to be involved in the Anton 3 project. Thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to take your questions. All right, so thank you very much for that fantastic uh, uh, walkthrough. Uh, so I would like to take the opportunity to uh, introduce Brandon Batson, who will be joining us for the Q&A. Uh, he worked on the architecture, logic design, and physical design for all three generations of Anton, with a primary focus on specialized arithmetic pipelines. In a prior life, he was one of the lead inventors of the QPI cast coherency protocol at Intel and worked on the Alpha EV7 and EV8 processors. Uh, we're going to start with some questions from the Slack channel, and then I uh, get to ask some of my own. Um, so, 
to start with, uh, I think one question that we saw from a couple folks in the Slack channel is, you know, this is uh, uh, an architecture a system, you know, very focused on molecular dynamics. Uh, do you think that there are potential ways that it could be applied to other workloads besides molecular dynamics simulations? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, there are a broad set of MD related work applications, things like virtual screening, uh, advanced force fields that model things, polarizability and so on. Uh, and Anton is fairly broadly applicable across that class. But our focus at DESRES is on biological systems and especially molecular dynamics. And we really just haven't put a whole lot of energy into looking beyond that. Although there are some interesting internal projects which we hope to reveal at a future time. Fantastic. All right. So uh, since, uh, according to your bio, you have a specialty in uh, different numerics. One of the questions I had wanted to ask is, you know, especially in light of all the uh, different numerical formats used in machine learning, what are some of the numerical formats that you used in different portions of Anton 3 and, and where were they employed? Well, as Adam mentioned, our computation is broadly divided into two classes. There's kind of a a uh, more classical general purpose flexible subsystem. Uh, there we use, we rely heavily on 32-bit fixed point operations in vector forms of those. Um, but in our specialized arithmetic pipelines, uh, you know, we're all over the place. We, there are places where we have 14-bit man tesses with five-bit exponents. There are places where we're in log domain. Um, we, we very, since we're used, doing unrolled pipelines, we trim the precisions very carefully on stage by stage basis based on a very careful numeric analysis. And that's where a lot of our value proposition comes from for uh, computational density. Well, that's really cool. So it's this interaction between knowing the algorithm, knowing the stage of the computation, and then being able to pick, you know, so, like the log domain transform you, you articulate. It seems like that would be a very powerful tool. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, all right. So a question on uh, power management. Um, so you mentioned that uh, uh, all of the pins that you could use are available for power and ground, basically. Um, do you use uh, DVFS or other DIDT control methods? Uh, how, is, how is that handled, given that power delivery is so challenging? We don't do any dynamic voltage scaling. Um, we do some kind of ad hoc dynamic frequency scaling in the form of um, clock choppers, or essentially we knock teeth out of the clock uh, based on some digital measurements of, uh, of activity. So essentially ramp limiters. Um, and we have various versions of those, ones that work at low frequency and some work at higher frequency. Thus far, we haven't used them a whole lot. We use the low frequency ones in sort of uh, automatic mode, and that seems to work pretty well. But we think there's potentially some margin we can squeeze out uh, once we tune up the higher precision for, or the higher frequency versions of those mechanisms. Gotcha. And then uh, we have a, a sort of a question in a similar vein, actually, from Alan Baum of uh, Esperanto, who I believe is a former colleague of yours from DAC. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. Um, so uh, you're using a global low skew clock mesh, um, which he says he suspects might be kind of high power as opposed to mesochronous clocking. Can you um, kind of go into that decision a bit? Well, it's a difficult trade-off, and it's one I think all these companies that you see are presenting uh, high-performance chips. They kind of attack this problem from a little different direction. Um, certainly, uh, locally synchronous, globally asynchronous, gals clocking or mesochronous can be powerful tools. We chose to do a uh, a uh, a unified, common pre-driver clock tree onto a global shared mesh to get very low latency communication for messages crossing our mesh. And that was the right trade-off this time around. Um, it leads to very low SKUs. It is high power, but not as high power as you would think. We're a 360 watt chip, you know, maybe, uh, maybe 40, 50 watts of that is clock power, um, which is not unreasonable. All right. Um, and then uh, a question for me. Uh, 
did you look into any advanced packaging at all? Um, or is, you know, that's just something you might want to explore further down on, on the roadmap? Can you sort of uh, give some insight into why or uh, you? Sure. Uh, the, the ecosystem just wasn't there yet um, for very high performance chips. Uh, at the time we were architecting Anton 3, these are chips that take a very, these are clean sheet designs where everything gets re-architected so they take a long time to build. Um, but next time around, it's definitely something that we're interested in and, you know, hopefully we'll get to collaborate with some people who are uh, listening to this talk right now. Gotcha, right. So in part, sort of the, the immaturity of things like uh, complex packaging techniques, especially given your team size, sounds like that would be a challenge. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, we have one from Jeffrey Vetter at uh, Oak Ridge National Labs. Um, can you comment on uh, how, you, if you can scale the system beyond 512 nodes for larger MD simulations, and then if there are any other types of molecular dynamics you've considered, uh, such as those focused on material science? Um, okay, those are both good questions. So I can tell you that the hardware is physically capable of scaling larger than 512 nodes in terms of the network and the link layer. But uh, the machine is definitely designed to operate nominally for where a single molecular dynamic simulation runs on at most 512 nodes. Um, the larger configurations would be, well, if you want to run multiple simulations and sort of exchange data between them. There's some facility for doing that. For the other applications, in particular material science, it's possible there are some material science applications uh, that would benefit from, uh, from Anton. We've looked at this somewhat within DesRes, but not a whole lot. Like I said before, you know, we're not a computer company. Our focus is on um, curing diseases and easing human misery, and we just don't spend a lot of time working on things outside of that scope. That makes sense. Um, so we have uh, uh, a question from Yuichiro Ajima of Fujitsu. Uh, can you talk about the internode communication and what sort of transmission technology and transmission speeds you are using? Uh, we're using an, an uh, NRZ Certes. That's where the, the links run at. It's a differential pair, dual unidirectional where each pair operates at, I think, 29 to 30 gigabits per second, and we're still tuning that. Got it. So you aren't needing to use, uh, like, forward error correction on that, right? So you're still getting, like, pretty reasonable latency. Yes, and, and latency is a big issue for us. So we've tried to avoid, you know, forward error correction as much as possible. Yeah, that makes sense. And you probably have, I imagine, you know, given if you're running a 30 gig of transfers, you know, you probably have a little bit more headroom there, too. Yeah, although, but these are these are large systems running over long cables and back planes in some cases. Uh, so you know the eye isn't huge. Uh, it's it's kind of a struggle to make it run that fast, but it works. Got it. Um, and then uh, uh, we've got a question from Umar Darbaz. Uh, I apologize. Uh, I probably butchered your name there. Who is from Nvidia? And he had a question on molecular dynamics. Uh, specifically, you know, is there any way to use dynamic programming to help reuse computations, sort of given a set of particle coordinates and initial force vectors, and then sort of skip ahead and reduce work? Um, you know, maybe using lookup tables for something like this. It's very difficult in molecular dynamics to use stale data. Um, because of an important property of time integrable systems called simplicity, you kind of, uh, you, you need our simulation, we need our simulations to only consume data that is current. It can't be, you know, from previous time steps. You can maybe use that speculatively if you have the ability to roll back. But so I think the answer for us, at least thus far, is no. Or if so, we haven't figured out how to do it yet. So you, you essentially need a pretty strong consistency and ordering model, at least between those time steps. That's right. That would be sort of the, you know, from uh, long ago days and thinking in terms of memory order models, that would be the way of reasoning about it. It's very sequentially consistent. Right. Right. And that's probably also, you know, may, may lead to some of the latency sensitivity in the system, right? Absolutely. Which is uh, the main reason that you would say that we are, 
you know, you see factors of 20 improvement over, uh, over general purpose machines is because we are so designed around those latency constraints. So we've got uh, another one, and uh, then I think we'll, we'll I, I should mention that we're eating into everyone's lunch time, so you should all feel free to drop off. But uh, uh, Brandon uh, gracefully agreed to an extended interrogation. Um, so Armin Farugi uh, asked, uh, who is unaffiliated, asked, what sort of reference model do you use for verification of TB unit and chip? TB unit? I'm not sh sure I know the acronym. Yeah, I guess the question, I mean, uh, so I'm not entirely sure if he's referring to sort of verification of the simulation against physical phenomena or verification of, you know, sort of the hardware in sort of the standard, uh, you know, chip design sense. So the, the latter, the latter interpretation, I don't think there's anything special um, that, that we do. We have a very good design verification team and we've had first silicon has worked on every Anton generation, which is, uh, 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 kind of impressive for, for those of you who have worked on these types of systems. Uh, for the former verification, that's a kind of a more interesting application specific question. Uh, we do have uh, software models that run on um, general purpose uh, uh, GPUs and general purpose processors. Desmond is our software package. We use that for trying out a lot of our new chemistry applications, but that is not something that uh, we, we can compare it against with bitwise accuracy because those are floating point based models um, and we tend to run in fixed point with very unique esoteric kind of arithmetic calculations. Um, so we do a lot of like numeric analysis on pre-silicon models of, that are bit identical to what the hardware produces and we have a slew of chemistry and force field tests that we use to uh, verify those models and then we use those models to verify our implementation of the hardware. All right. It sounds like Armin was actually asking about a TV was test bench. Uh, so I think it's probably ah, on the hardware side. Um, gotcha. But yeah, I think you covered that. All right. Well, I am, I am getting the signal from the powers that be that uh, 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 people in the control room want to eat. So uh, <laughs> wrap this up. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Brandon, for the Q&A. Uh, thank you to Adam for the fantastic uh, presentation, and uh, with that, uh, we'll turn it over to the break.